Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Joshua Daniel is a recent graduate of the Divinity School. He received his PhD in theology last March, writing a dissertation under Professor William Schweiker on H. Richard Niebuhr and educational theorist Paolo Freire, <laughs> focused on the theme of moral formation. Broadly speaking, Dr. Daniel's recent work concentrates on the intersection of theological ethics and social theory around issues of moral perception and the character of embodiment. Since graduating, He has been teaching classes in philosophy and religious studies at schools around the Chicago area, Elmhurst College, St. Xavier University, and St. Augustine College. The title of the paper he will be presenting today is An Edwardsian Theoethical Aesthetics of Recognition. Please welcome Joshua Daniel. Um, Good morning. Thank you for attending the conference and Thank you for listening to me, because you can do the former without doing the latter. The title is slightly misleading. It turned out it was too ambitious. The claim I advance in this presentation is that Jonathan Edwards' Trinitarian theology provides resources for considering life in a multicultural world. I will validate this claim by showing how one facet of Edwards' Trinitarian thought helps us think through one particular issue that besets the practice of multicultural recognition. The issue I mean is articulated by political theorist Patch and Markell and concerns the relation between identity and agency. Historically disadvantaged groups have begun to demand the recognition of their particular identities as a social good without which justice remains incomplete. And I mean the recognition is the good. The idea is that, in order to be full participants in the public and political sphere, such groups require being perceived and valued for who they are truly, that is, according to the standards of their particular historical and or cultural identities. This demand has raised a host of political philosophical objections, but the objection I discuss is moral ontological. Demands for recognition treat identities as entities stable and fixed enough to be perceived truly and valued accordingly. And yet, insofar as identities are forged in and through relations between human subjects, which the demand for recognition itself presumes, acts of recognition necessarily shape their subjects' identities. So is it possible to give the recognition that is demanded? Or can I only offer an alliance going forward? If the latter, isn't there the danger that social disparities will inflect the offered alliance? That my offer itself will demand the other to conform to some unspoken identity that shapes the alliance I'm offering, thus re-provoking their demand for recognition? Markel's solution is to promote acknowledgement of our shared finitude and vulnerability as agents as an alternative to the recognition of our distinct identities. My claim is that such acknowledgement is grounded in a form of recognition that, despite Markel's worries, empowers rather than constricts shared agency. I will argue this claim through Edwards' Trinitarian theology and a Trinitarian construal of his account of virtue. Rather than appeal to his social account of the Trinity, the sort of account that seems ready-made to address the issue of relating difference, I will utilize his psychological account. Here, Edwards characterizes God along the lines of recognition, so I will argue. God renders himself God by perceiving himself truly as divine and valuing himself accordingly as deserving glory. God expresses himself as divine by creating us to become participants in the form of recognition that joins the triune persons and constitutes triune deity, thus empowering us to recognize God. Meanwhile, 
To become truly virtuous is to become such a participant. What this entails on our part is the mutual unsettling of our finite human identities in order to empower each other to create novel forms of recognition that bind us more intimately to each other. Such a practice is grounded in the mutual recognition of each other as potentially divine subjects. And paradoxically, it might demand, in particular situations, the affirmation of others in all of their historical, cultural particularity. What follows comes in two sections. The theological account, in which God as Trinitarian is characterized as a structure of recognition, and then the ethical possibility, in which human relations and practices of recognition are characterized insofar as they are structured by divine recognition. My presentation is heavy on the theology and light on its application to multicultural recognition, but this distribution has a rhetorical point, for me anyway. Theology can help us navigate the vagaries of contemporary life, but only by attending to its own. So the first section, theological account. Edwards contends that deity is, quote, begotten by God's loving an idea of himself. My task in this section is to construe this formulation through the notion of recognition. I will argue that triune deity is a structure of recognition by reading Edwards' psychological account of the Trinity through the lens of recent work on the concept of recognition. The point of this is to lay the theological ground for thinking through human practices of recognition in the second section. So according to Edwards, there is deity at all because God has an idea of himself and loves that idea. Edwards formulates this in the course of explicating divine happiness. Quote, God is infinitely happy in the enjoyment of himself. Such enjoyment entails that God beholds himself and then values himself accordingly. These two distinct but inseparable moments are what the concept of recognition combines. In a critical interpretation of Charles Taylor, Markell explains that in one sense, quote, recognition brings together cognition and evaluation. It is a matter both of seeing who someone is and affirming or negating what we see. End quote. Recognition involves knowledge that matters, responding axiologically to what we perceive. Hence, to say that God enjoys himself, that God beholds himself and thus loves himself, is to suggest that God recognizes himself. Markel delineates a second sense of recognition, a constructivist sense whereby recognizing others means establishing them with a particular status. The first time I said, I love you, to my wife, I not only expressed a particular perception and evaluation of her, I also established her as having a particular status in my life, as one whom I could begin imagining as my wife. Recall the quote that initiated this section. Deity is begotten by God's loving an idea of himself. In other words, God establishes himself as God by recognizing himself. Deity is constructed by God's love to himself by way of his self-knowledge. Markel's two senses of recognition, cognition plus evaluation on one hand and construction on the other, coincide in Edward's account of self, God's self-enjoyment. This is important to note because Markel discerns a tension between the two as they play out in political practice. Recognition as cognition plus evaluation promotes an understanding of human agency and relations as is expressive of and answerable to identities that are always already settled. To practice recognition in this sense is to recognize others according to a fixed identity. Recognition as construction promotes an understanding of identities as the results of shared energy 
that is constitutively unpredictable and risky. In this constructivist sense, the practice is less recognizing the truth of others' identities and more acknowledging the finitude and vulnerability we share with others, and so becoming open to the mutual transformation of our identities. If the former practice privileges identity over agency, understanding our identities to shape agency, the latter privileges agency over identity, since it understands our agency to outrun any identities we achieve. For Markel, the former involves an aspiration to sovereignty. We attempt to overcome our cognitive finitude by binding our actions to our recognition of the truth of others. If we don't get each other wrong, we can't treat each other wrongly. Constructivist acknowledgement, on the other hand, is a practice of non-sovereignty, openness to the unpredictability and novel results of our shared agency requires the renunciation of any claim to have overcome our finitude. Instead of getting each other right in order to exercise sovereignty over our shared world, we should be supporting each other's finite, vulnerable potency in the world. We best avoid treating each other wrongly by acknowledging that finitude is an unavoidable condition of our agency and acting accordingly. What Markel opposes coincides in Edward's account of God's self-enjoyment. Markel discerns a gap between identity and agency bedeviling human existence, and the way to justice is by acknowledging this gap, not by attempting to close it through practices of recognition. Such a gap does not bedevil God. God's identity as God God's identity as God is God's act of recognizing himself. I will argue that the coincidence of identity and agency in God means that human practices of acknowledging mutual finitude are grounded in the recognition of something true about us as humans. That is, human openness to unpredictability and novelty vis-a-vis -vis our various finite identities is grounded in the recognition of our shared destiny as participants in deity, in God's self-enjoyment by way of divine recognition. The link is Edward's account of deity as triune. Triune deity can be understood as a structure of recognition because the Trinitarian persons together enact God's self-recognition. Edwards utilizes a psychological analogy to articulate this. While the Father is, quote, deity in its direct existence, the Son and the Spirit are deity's knowledge and will, or idea and love, respectively. The Son is the idea that God beholds of himself, so as to enjoy himself. Funding this account is Edwards' particular metaphysical idealism. All things exist only insofar as they are in some consciousness. So to be is to be the object of some consciousness. Supposing a room empty of conscious beings, Edwards asserts that the things in it would exist only insofar as God is conscious of them. Hence, all things exist only insofar as God is conscious of them. And this includes God himself. Edwards refers to the Father as, quote, the deity subsisting in the prime, unoriginated, and most absolute manner. But the logic of his idealism insists that deity absolutely subsisting is not yet deity with full being. Deity does not achieve full being without becoming the object of divine consciousness, and this is what the Son enables. As God's idea of himself, the Son is the intertriune object of divine consciousness. If referring to the Son as an idea seems impersonalizing, another aspect of Edward's idealism must be considered. The Son is God's perfect idea of himself. And for Edwards, this means that the Son is deity, quote, truly and properly repeated. On this view, a true and proper idea of something, 
is that thing itself, repeated. Edwards illustrates this with ideas of what he calls spiritual things. To have an idea of a thought is to have that thought again. Whenever I have an idea for my love for my wife, it involves me experiencing to some degree that very love. Since God's idea, since God's ideas are necessarily perfect, the Son, as God's idea of himself, is truly and properly God himself. Quote, the Son is the deity generated by God's understanding or having an idea of himself and subsisting in that idea. End quote. The Son helps ensure the full being of deity as the divine object of divine consciousness, which entails him being the second person of triune deity. But only with the Holy Spirit is deity's being fully achieved. God not only beholds an idea of himself, he loves this idea of himself. What occurs between the Father and Son is not one subject's sheer consciousness of another object, but rather mutual love and joy. As God's divine object, the Son enables divine self-consciousness. As God's divine object, God's perfect idea of himself, and so God himself, which is to say, as a person of triune deity, the Son achieves two further things. First, he is the shining forth of God's own glory, enabling the Father to delight in that glory. Thus, the Son begins to render deity aesthetic, not only conscious and existent. More accurately, the Son helps ensure the fullness of deity's being by beginning to render deity aesthetic. As the shining forth of divine glory that provokes the Father's delight, the Son reveals God's beauty. Second, though programmatically the object of divine self-consciousness, the Son becomes a divine subject as well, since he comes to love and delight in the Father as the Father does in him. The character of the Son's objectivity ensures his subjectivity. What accounts for the Son's subjectivity is the Holy Spirit. Not in the sense that the Father puts the Holy Spirit within the Son and thereby renders the Son a subject of love. Edwards is clear that the Holy Spirit arises between the Father and the Son as, quote, a most pure act, an infinitely holy and sacred energy. The Holy Spirit accounts for the Son's subjectivity in the sense that the Spirit accounts for the Father's particular subjectivity. The Son is the object not simply of God's self-consciousness, but more particularly of the Father's love, characterized by God along the lines of a, characterized by Edwards along the lines of aesthetic delight. It is the nature of such love to flow out or breathe forth towards others. Thus, insofar as the Son receives the Father's love, which demands to be shared, the Son becomes able to return that love. This divine love, mutually shared between Father and Son, is the Holy Spirit. Edwards refers to the Spirit as, quote, deity subsisting in act, meaning that the Spirit is deity insofar as it flows out, breathes itself forth. Just as the Son is God's perfect idea of himself, so the Spirit is God's perfect act. What breathes forth in the Spirit is nothing less than deity itself, the same deity repeated in the Son. In this way, the Spirit is the third person of triune deity, whereby deity achieves the fullness of its being. Importantly, the trajectory of the Holy Spirit specifies the character of deity's fullness of being. The Spirit is the divine love of the Father and Son, breathed out primarily towards each other and secondarily towards creatures. Thus, the fullness of deity's being, specified by the Spirit, is the communion of the divine persons, which is open to include human creatures, 
insofar as we participate in the Spirit that joins Father and Son. In this sense, the Holy Spirit accounts for our subjectivity within the divine communion, since our participation in that mutual love between Father and Son enables us to be subjects of divine love. The fullness of deity's being consists in its communication, which creates communication between the trying persons and between God and humans. This communication of deity is empowering. It is not the mere transfer of some reality or knowledge to another, but rather the investing of that real reality and knowledge in another who thereby becomes their subject. Within deity, this occurs with the Son, who becomes the subject of divine love because he is the object of the Father's love. Edwards contends that Christ is called the face of God because in the Son, God sees himself as though looking in a mirror. Edwards himself does not exploit the fact that the face of a person is not only what others behold of that person, but also what that person uses to behold others. As the face of God, the Son not only manifests divine beauty to the Father, but also beholds that very beauty as it is manifested in the Father. The Holy Spirit accounts for the Son's subjectivity because, as the divine love mutually shared between Father and Son, the Spirit must be the mutual manifestation and beholding of divine beauty between them. This dynamic also occurs beyond deity, maybe without deity. Our creation is a communication of God's being. Edwards famously asserts that God's end in creating the world is his own glory, which he accomplishes by enabling creatures to behold that glory themselves. Quote, "'Tis a thing infinitely good in itself that God's glory should be known by a glorious society of created beings." End quote. Creation not only manifests God's glory, but through humans participating in the spirit, beholds that glory. Recall that Edwards articulates this Trinitarian account of deity in the course of explicating divine happiness. This is because the fullness of deity's being, which can be achieved only insofar as God is triune, is divine happiness. God is happy insofar as God enjoys himself. God enjoys himself insofar as God is triune. That is, insofar as God loves the idea of himself. And God loves the idea of himself insofar as God communes with himself. Hence, Edward's assertion, quote, The happiness of the deity, as all other true happiness, consists in love and society. End quote. Meanwhile, such love in society, which can only be the divine communion of the triune persons, has a simultaneously aesthetic and empowering character. God's self-enjoyment consists in the Father and Son's mutual delight in divine beauty, which they accomplish by their reciprocal manifestation and beholding of God's glory in the Holy Spirit. Thereby, the Son becomes the subject of divine love, not simply its object. Moreover, this aesthetic and empowering communion is communicated to us insofar as God creates us to become subjects of divine love, beholders of and delighters in God's beautiful glory. This Trinitarian detour returns us to the notion of recognition. What I have called the aesthetic and empowering character of divine communion align with Markel's two senses of recognition. Recognition is cognition plus evaluation, is aesthetic recognition, perceiving someone truly and valuing them accordingly. To say that God beholds himself through the Son and loves himself in the Spirit is to say that God recognizes himself through the Son in the Spirit. In this sense, the Son can be understood as the object of divine recognition that triune person through which God is recognized as God. And the spirit 
can be understood as the binding of divine recognition. That triune person in which God accomplishes self God accomplishes self-recognition by the binding that joins the Father and the Son to each other. Recognition as construction is empowering recognition, enabling those who are recognized to recognize others in return. To say that the deity is begotten insofar as God loves what he beholds of himself through the Son and the Spirit is to say that God begets himself as God insofar as he recognizes himself. This begetting recognition is accomplished in the Son, becoming the subject of divine recognition by returning the Father's recognition of his divine beauty and glory as something that binds them together. The Spirit remains the binding of divine recognition, but now its active sense is emphasized. The Spirit is the ongoing binding of Father and Son because the divine recognition that occurs between Father and Son is ongoing since both are each other's subject and object of divine recognition. Moreover, the Spirit's work includes binding us to the divine recognition that binds Father and Son by constituting us as subjects of that recognition. In order for us to recognize God aesthetically, we must become divine. Edwards describes this as the indwelling of the Spirit within our human faculties becoming the soul's new principle of action. I suggest that the spirit becomes the principle of our soul's actions insofar as its ongoing binding of us to the ongoing recognition that the binds father and son enables us to participate in that divine recognition as its subjects. To conclude this section, triune deity is a structure of recognition, or better, the ongoing structuring of recognition. God constitutes himself as God by recognizing himself in and through the recognitive activity shared by the triune persons. In turn, as I will argue next, God structures our own practices of recognition, both of himself and of each other, not by modeling human relations according to the recognitive relations between the triune persons, but rather by shaping our human recognitive relations so that they become sites of divine recognition, where we can practice recognizing each other as God recognizes us, perceiving each other truly, valuing each other accordingly, and enabling each other to keep this ongoing. This brings me to Edwards' ethics. I construed Edward's account of triune deity as a structure of recognition in that God constitutes himself as fully divine by the ongoing recognitive activity of the triune persons diffused outward in creation and redemption. My task now is to construe his account of true virtue as a form of recognition, as a disposition to recognize God as divine and each other in turn as potentially divine. Edwards contends, quote, to be truly virtuous is the same as to be spiritual, meaning that we accomplish true virtue to the extent that the Holy Spirit indwells us as a principle of action. If the Spirit can be understood as the binding of divine recognition between Father and Son, then true virtue can be understood as our participation in that binding, empowering us to become subjects of divine recognition, beholding and delighting in God's beautiful glory and in each other, insofar as we participate in that glory. My exegetical strategy is to develop Edward's work, The Nature of True Virtue, through last section's recognitive reading of his psychological account of the Trinity. According to Edwards, virtue is the moral beauty of intelligent beings, that beauty that attends beings with perception and will whose dispositions and actions are praiseworthy or blameworthy. Recall that perception and will are the capacities that compose the aesthetic sense of recognition, cognition plus evaluation. Virtue can be understood as the sort of beauty that attends recognitive beings. Meanwhile, the praise and blame attributable to such beings regards their manner of practicing recognition. Recognition. 
Edward's object of inquiry is the nature of true virtue, which he distinguishes from seeming virtue. The key to this distinction is that between particular and general beauty. Particular beauty is the beauty of something vis-a-vis -vis its relation and tendency to others within a limited sphere. General beauty is the beauty of something vis-a-vis -vis all of its relations and tendencies, its relations and tendencies to all others in all spheres. These can conflict. Automatic obedience has a particular beauty within the military, but generalized to other spheres becomes ugly. For Edwards, true virtue is an instance of general beauty, so it attends recognitive beings who relate or tend to all other beings. Quote, true virtue most essentially consists in benevolence to being in general, end quote. The truly virtuous are praiseworthy because the acts of their mind and the exercises of their love have being in general as their direct and immediate object. This might seem to suggest that love for particular beings has no beauty or virtue at all, but Edwards insists that particular loves can be truly virtuous insofar as they arise from benevolence to being in general. If true virtue is the moral beauty that attends recognitive beings, then benevolence to being in general can be understood as a form of divine recognition. Edwards explicitly clarifies that benevolence to being in general is simply proper love of God. Being in general is a philosophical locution for God, who Edwards describes as, quote, the being of beings, the head of the universal system of existence, the foundation and fountain of all being and of all beauty. Hence, the true virtue of recognitive beings does not regard simply the extent of love, as though moral beauty increases incrementally as we relate to each other or as we relate to wider and wider communities of beings. Rather, and this is where Edward's Trinitarian thought becomes fruitful, true virtue means loving that particular being who happens to be a communion of persons whose mutual love and delight flow out into the creation and redemption of recognitive beings. So understood, true virtue is participation in the divine recognition that occurs mutually between Father and Son and the Spirit. Responding to the criticism that God is not a proper object of benevolence, Edwards notes that the sense of benevolence we can hold towards God is not contributing to his happiness, which is impossible for us, but rather rejoicing in it thus becoming instruments for the promotion of divine glory. Even in this sense, benevolence is impossible for us on our own. Only the indwelling of the Spirit empowers us to rejoice in God's happiness, because only in the Spirit do we become participants in God's self-enjoyment. Hence, to have benevolence to being in general, which is to be truly virtuous, is to be empowered to be subjects of divine recognition. What Edward suggests about benevolence aligns with Markel's distinction between kinds of recognition. It has aesthetic and empowering senses. The benevolence we have towards God is aesthetic because rejoicing in the divine happiness involves perceiving God truly as divine and valuing him accordingly as worthy of divine delight. Meanwhile, God so empowering us to exercise aesthetic benevolence making us divine so that we may perceive God truly and value him accordingly, is itself an exercise of benevolence. To understand this, we must understand Edward's distinction between benevolence and complacence. Complacence is loving something by way of delighting in its beauty. Benevolence is loving something by way of inclining to its well-being and delighting in its happiness. While complacence presupposes beauty in the beloved as its ground, benevolence does not. Edwards argues that the divine love that grounds the being and beauty of created things, that motivates creation and redemption, is benevolence. Just as the divine love by which God creates us cannot presuppose our being, since it grounds that very being, so the divine love by which God empowers us to become truly virtuous subjects of divine recognition cannot presuppose our moral beauty, 
but rather grounds it. Hence, our capacity for aesthetically recognizing God results from God's empowering recognition of us. But this must involve a true perception and feeling evaluation of us. I'm contending, in other words, that there is an aesthetic component involved in God's empowering recognition, not as its ground, but as entailed by it. Edwards notes that if divine benevolence grounds creation, then God's love extends to potential beings. I suggest that God's empowering recognition of us as subjects of divine recognition involves perceiving us as potentially divine and valuing us accordingly, such that he treats us as future participants in triune deity. The truth about us humans, which God recognizes, is that we can be divine. God's empowering recognition of us constitutes us to be divine so that we can recognize God aesthetically. God structures divine recognition so as to include us as its subjects. The ethical issue is how God's structuring of recognition shapes practices of recognition between humans. The first clue is Edward's discussion of the objects of truly virtuous love. The primary object of true virtue is being in general, which I have argued should be understood as God and his triune deity. The secondary object of true virtue is benevolent being, beings that exercise the benevolence to being in general that constitutes true virtue. True virtue primarily loves God and secondarily loves love of God. Stated otherwise, a being that recognizes God as truly divinely beautiful must recognize the recognition of God as truly divinely beautiful as well, since to recognize God is to participate in triune deity as a divine subject of recognition. This suggests that the beauty that humans ought to recognize in each other regards our exercise of divine recognition. This is a fraught enterprise as Edwards himself well knew. Beyond the epistemological and social perplexities that would arise, such an enterprise of trying to recognize who's already divine seems beside the point given the social context that provokes questions of human recognition, multicultural difference. It's unclear that the insistence to recognize exercises of divine recognition would help resolve the difficulties of multicultural recognition, especially if Edwards is its source. Still, if we chasten his insistence, I believe Edwards offers a theological contribution to the difficulties of multicultural recognition. The key to this chastening is what I suggested above. The truth about us that God recognizes is our potential divine subjectivity. This is the beauty that we ought to recognize in each other. Recall Edward's distinction between general and particular beauty. The distinction between loving God and loving particular creatures coincides with this. To love God is to recognize the divine beauty of being in general. To love particular creatures is to recognize the beauty of the limited spheres in which we relate to them families, political alliances, cultural groups. If God can be understood as the very structure of recognition, creating and redeeming us by the ongoing recognition that constitutes his triune deity, then we can think of human life as composed of spheres of recognition, forms of social binding in which we recognize, praise, and blame each other according to the standards of the identities these spheres provide. Edwards would insist that such human spheres of recognition, if undisciplined by our participation in divine recognition, would necessarily militate against divine recognition, just as private affections, undisciplined by benevolence to being in general, prop up something creaturely in place of God. However, if love for God can, if love for creatures can arise from proper love of God, then our practices of recognition may arise from divine recognition and become truly virtuous. Edwards suggests two indicators of this. Practices of human recognition 
should coincide with God's manner of recognizing humans, and their aim should be agreeable to God's end in creation. As we've seen, God's end is his own glory, which he promotes by his manner of recognizing us, empowering us to behold his glory. Thus, truly virtuous human practices of recognition turn out to be practices that empower those recognized to become subjects of divine recognition. This is the second clue about God structuring of, about how God structuring of recognition shapes human practices of recognition and its intention with the first. The first clue suggests that what we ought to recognize in each other is the true virtue we exercise, the divine beauty of our actual recognition of divine beauty. This second clue suggests that how we ought to recognize others is by empowering them to become truly virtuous. The first presupposes actual true virtue. The second presupposes its possibility. If we let this second clue chase in the first, then what we ought to recognize in each other's becomes our potential to become subjects of divine recognition. This has advantages. It coincides precisely with God's constitutive recognition of us, not simply in its end, true virtue, but more significantly in its manner, empowerment. To recognize others' potential to become truly virtuous rather than their actual achievement of that is to recognize a fact about them that demands recognition, not an accomplishment that merits recognition. Moreover, recognizing the fact of this potential in others should motivate us to help them capitalize on it. It evokes our empowering agency. Human practices of recognition that pretend to the potentiality of true virtue do not rely on a spiritual hierarchy that marks some as deserving of recognition and others not. Rather, they rely on a vision of spiritual equality meant to evoke our mutual empowerment. In this way, we recognize each other as God recognizes us, which means acknowledging our finitude in sin while anticipating our full participation in the divine recognition that joins Father and Son in the Spirit. Of course, our mutual empowerment is limited and cannot accomplish what God's empowering recognition does. This provokes the question of what mutual empowerment towards true virtue involves within our limited spheres of recognition. What do we empower each other to do? And what must we perceive and value about each other in order to do this? I submit that human practices of recognition arising from divine recognition require loosening the bindings that compose our spheres of recognition. Undisciplined by divine recognition, human practices of recognition bind us to each other falsely. What we come to perceive and value about each other is not our potential for true virtue, but rather something far less, namely our capacity to participate in a particular sphere of recognition and sustain its existence. Such bindings of recognition necessarily constrict us, since they involve us recognizing each other as reduced versions of ourselves rendering ourselves carriers of finite identities seeking to fix themselves in God's place. In Markel's terms, this is the practice of sovereignty. We attempt to get each other right by recognizing each other according to a particular standard of perception and value so as to treat each other rightly. However, treating each other rightly here reduces to conforming to the sphere of recognition that provides the standards of right recognition in the first place. Markel's alternative is the practice of non-sovereignty, whereby we acknowledge the vulnerability of our identities by becoming open to the unpredictable possibilities of shared agency. I think Edwards suggests something similar. Human practices of recognition arising from divine recognition acknowledge the vulnerability of the identities produced by our spheres of recognition. To become participants in the divine recognition by the indwelling of the spirit is to become capable of a form of recognition that lies beyond the imaginative resources of our finite spheres of recognition and so cannot be delimited by our finite identities. To be open to this recognitive potential is to become open to the possibility that our finite identities require unsettling, which means loosening the bindings of human recognition so that we have the room to engage in such unsettling. <clears throat> 
This is the sense in which we practice mutual empowerment toward true virtue. We empower each other to constitute our spheres of recognition as vulnerable to the unsettling of its aesthetic standards. Against Markel, I insist that acknowledgement of mutual vulnerability and the unsettling of recognitive identities it entails are not an alternative to recognition, but rather grounded in our aesthetic recognition of each other as potential subjects of divine recognition. This form of aesthetic recognition does not endanger the vulnerability of identities that non-sovereign acknowledgement requires, because the potentiality for true virtue is not the sort of identity that could constrict our practices of recognition. It simply affirms that there is un an unimaginable form of recognition, divine, that we are nevertheless ultimately capable of practicing. When we recognize each other as potential subjects of divine recognition, we are not getting each other right in the sense of fully comprehending what this possibility entails. Rather, we perceive truly and value accordingly the fact that we are meant to become bearers of divine recognition. This form, rec this form of recognition grounds our encouragement of each other to be open to the unimaginable recognition of God, by which openness we empower each other to loosen the bindings of our spheres of recognition and so unsettle our shared identities and thereby treat each other right. This is our true beauty, this side of the eschaton, and it must be aesthetically recognized to become empowering. Final move. What does all this involve between spheres of recognition? That is, under conditions of multicultural difference. Encouraging my fellow white Americans to loosen the bindings of recognition that white America imposes so that we don't confuse the success of American endeavors with God's intentions might be salutary. But what does it suggest for how I should relate to African Americans or recent immigrants, particularly when these groups demand recognition according to their standards of recognition? If my relation to my own group entails loosening its recognitive bindings and unsettling its identity, and it is based on a recognition of my fellows as potentially divine and so truly excessive to any such bindings and identities, then it would seem that I should encourage those in other groups to loosen their recognitive bindings and unsettle their identities, to convince them that they are truly excessive to the bindings and identities they are demanding I recognize. But isn't this simply to refuse their demand for recognition? And insofar as my exhortations involve convincing them of their divine potential, which conception of divinity is of Western origin, doesn't this add the insult of misrecognition to the initial injury of non-recognition? In a multicultural context, a good way to practice loosening the bindings of recognition within one's own sphere might be to accede to another group's demands for recognition on their own terms. Learning to perceive and value as another historical or cultural group does can help encounter any perceived self-evidence of one's own native standards of recognition. Affirming another is good for unsettling oneself. Moreover, while accepting the Edwardian account of recognition I have offered commits one to view finite spheres of recognition as vulnerable and their proffered identities as more unsettled than fixed, it cannot necessitate that multicultural encounters take the form of exhorting others to unsettle themselves. Such a practice risks retightening the bindings of recognition within one's own sphere, constraining one to value others only insofar as they unsettle themselves, which means only insofar as they affirm one's own now critical standards of recognition. Recall that human practices of recognition arising from divine recognition involve loosening our finite bindings of recognition, not dissolving them. The point is to create enough room to empower each other to unsettle ourselves, but only for the purpose of creating new unpredictable forms of recognition. That is, the point of loosening our recognitive bindings is to empower each other and others to create new bindings 
new ways to enjoy each other. What this, this should fund is a form of social experimentum, expen, experimentalism, that refuses to claim in advance how standards of recognition particular to specific historical cultural groups ought to be approached and assessed. Edwards claims, quote, it pleases God to observe analogy in his works. Perhaps multicultural encounters are meant to be occasions in which forms of recognition are accomplished between human groups that are richer than those that constitute the groups themselves. Such forms of recognition would serve as analogies to divine recognition and thereby become sites for empowering each other to become truly virtuous. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. The relationship between claims about the nature of God and the moral actions motivated by those claims is quite direct in the position on offer from Mr. Daniel. This conception of the Trinity holds that God's nature is a self-constituting structure of recognition by which the fullness of divine being is achieved. God truly perceives himself and appropriately responds to this beholding in love. The metaphysical idealism proffered here entails that God's conception of something is the means of its creation and redemption. This is true of God's own being, of creation in general, and human beings in particular. Claiming this sort of metaphysical idealism has implications for what sort of recognitive practices ought to ensue ethically among human beings from this divine precedent. More specifically, if we understand it ourselves and others, as constituted by the creative recognition of God, which empowers us to become subjects of divine recognition by constitutively recognizing this potential in and into us, then our own recognitive practices should be similarly creative insofar as they remain open to novelty, that is, to creative transformation through intersubjective communication. Daniel points out that what this account should fund is, quote, a form of social experimentalism that refuses to claim in advance how standards of recognition, particular to specific historical cultural groups, ought to be approached and assessed. My worry is not different in kind, but in qualification, for we ought to be on guard against merely verbal solutions. In this vein, I suggest that the account on offer here could more fully develop its theoretical resources that would open it to the, to the genuine novelty that ought to arise between human beings, where creative intercommunication transforms the very structure of our desires and expectations. This conviction also arises from the acknowledgement of our shared finitude and vulnerability as human beings, as does the foundational conviction of Daniel's account. But this conviction ought to implicate the whole system we formulate. In, in other words, we mustn't performatively contradict our own concerns nor pay metaphysical compliments to God by exemption in working out an account of the value of novelty and recognition. Genuine openness to novelty sees life as a network of interde interdetermination, where identities are continually negotiated, whereby the creative nature of non-sovereign recognition will transform both our minds and our worlds to produce new sources of meaning. To be truly in service to this creative process could be understood in, this papers, in the present paper's terms as recognition of the creative ground of all being in the structure of divine recognition and a recognition of the implications of genuinely affirming the, quote, unimaginable recognition of God in relation to one another. If one is to avoid retightening one's own bindings by constraining oneself to value others only insofar as they unsettle themselves, the criteria for valuing the other person cannot be set in advance of creative transformation upon encounter. The terms of recognition and normative status is conferred are negotiated on the grounds of genuine openness to novelty through intersubjective agency. As I read him, Daniel argues as much. Yet, how on this account does, does the Edwardsian avoid a glaring agenda according to which the other parties to an encounter begin to suspect whether the ostensive openness to novelty is merely in service to a preconceived notion of what identities could be recognized as theologically permitted? The questions arise then, whether novelty is valued in and of itself or only insofar as it derives from and supports a given construal of divine recognition. I'm not quite sure that this should be an issue for Dr. Daniel. My worries here, however, are twofold. The first is theological. 
If God is understood under the present metaphysical idealism as a metaphysically transcendent ground of being, how is novelty by creative appreciation reflected in God's personal community? My theological concerns reflect those of Charles Hartzorn, for instance, with his account of perfect love not as absolute transcendence, but as a surrelativity or a supreme relatedness, whereby God, as consequent, enters into mutual interdetermination with the beloved. My second concern is ethical, and it arises concomitantly with the former. Indeed, such relatedness strikes me as a more adequate account of what human beings actually hold as an ethical ideal, as formulated through experiences of empathic intentionality. Indeed, as Henry Nelson Wyman has put it, empathy as co-suffering is seen as the necessary growing pains of, quote, all inner communication that is free, full, and honest, where we expose ourselves to the criticism of others and are forced to criticize ourselves and acknowledge in ourselves often much that is evil, where evil is understood as anything that obstructs creative good or destroys created good. Merging these two into a theoethical worry, if one's reasons for openness to novelty and intersubjective transformation of self is grounded in a conception of an unchanging God who, on the account on offer here, can truly mutually, trans can truly mutually transform, transformation be possible, if the theology itself is not revisable, if, that is, something is withheld from one participant that the other participant is not allowed to withhold. I suppose that my contention is ultimately with the ethical implications of a metaphysical idealism like Edwards, whereby perceiving being alone is properly being, and where God is understood as the perfect perceiver in pure act. This would seem to preclude from our encounters appreciation of the vast depths of experience that exceed our cognitive grasp at every point. And further, to preclude a more holistic account of the intimate connection between our conceptual content and total complex environing factors. Furthermore, understanding God as pure act appears to undermine an appreciation of human beings as more than just agents. It undermines an understanding of the humans as agent patients who suffer and struggle in a world where every decision is a trial and a test of self. We cannot understand each other as agents without empathizing with their struggles. What Dr. Daniel commendably points out for us is that our political terms of recognition ought to be creatively transformed themselves in response to the complex and ambiguous situations ever obtaining in the world. Daniel grounds this ethical prescription in a theological account of the structure of recognition, which he argues can inform our ethics of multicultural recognition. I might add, however, that such challenging encounters occur on much smaller levels than those of cultural clash and national conflict. They occur in the classroom and amongst family members, and often with devastatingly insidious consequences for the parties involved. I would challenge Dr. Daniel to further elucidate the resources this account has for accommodating epistemological humility at the theological level in order to enact it empathically at the ethical level. My questions for Dr. Daniel have led to the implicit suggestion that the theoethical order of explanation be reversed, by our, whereby our at-hand experiences of empathy ought to inform what theological conceptions of divinity coincide with the ideals that we lay our hands on in our everyday practice. This reversal would be best conceived not as a metaphysical dispute, but as a pragmatic one, concerning the utility of approaching certain problems with experiential tools that do not predetermine the ethics of recognition in advance of an encounter and thus, in Daniel's own words, do not reprovoke another's demand for recognition. Such a reprovocation can be avoided, I submit, by grounding our inquiry in reverence for the creative structure of vivifying contrasts which are, from which arose beings capable of such subtle sensitivity and responsiveness. Acknowledgement of the source of our shared vulnerability as a necessary risk entailed in the creation of such delicate and precarious harmonies as compose the human life should motivate accounts of the ethics of recognition, and this source of vulnerable finitude entails the risk of fallibilism. This is an account Daniel, this is, a, this is an acknowledgement Daniel makes, yet one must be on guard, lest the very theology which underwrites an ethic of non-sovereign recognition is unable to walk the line. These are, in any case, simply preparatory remarks intended to stoke an ensuing conversation in honor of Dr. Daniel's admirable work. And on that note, I'd like to open up the ground for questions directed to our presenter. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts.
Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.